way how to have this webinar online. Uh, this webinar is organized by World Muslim Congress in collaboration with Kashmir Institute of International Relations. Today's topic is COVID-19 upsets in India and plight of Kashmiri political prisoners. As you know, the pandemic has wrecked havocs all across the India where deadly disease is continuing thousands of, consuming thousands of lives each day. The crippling healthcare system, non-availability of necessary drugs, developing oxygen supplies to hospitals and above all, the government's absolute failure to handle the situation has pushed the Indians towards an unprecedented health crisis. While the entire Indian state is reeling under the crest of pandemic, sharp spike is a coronavirus death in the country has sent shock waves down the spine of the Kashmiris who has, whose nearest and dears uh, once continued to languish in overcrowded jails and detention centers in the different parts of India. Before we deal with what is happening to the Kashmiri prisoners in Indian jails, I may quote some of the statements from the international uh, personalities, especially the High Commission on Human Rights on 25th March 2020 warned that COVID-19 has begun to strike prisons, jails, immigration detention centers. She urged states not to forget those behind bars and to protect those working in closed facilities in their overall efforts to contain the pandemic. Likewise, on 3rd April 2020, UN High Commission on Human Rights spokesperson appealed the state to release every person detained without sufficient legal base, including political prisoners and those detained for critical uh, and descending views. On 9th of March 2021, UN expert on prison reforms said people in Toskid across the world are being disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Prison managements and services are weakly in the criminal justice system in many countries. Prisons constitute a segment of society which is easily forgotten by policymakers and the general public alike. In these joint communications to the government of India, UN special rapporteurs also raised the alarm on the upsurge of pandemic in Indian jails and made an urgent appeal to the government of India to release the, to release the political prisoners of Indian occupied Kashmir detained in different Indian jails. World Muslim Congress and Jammu Kashmir Council for Human Rights in their written statements for the 46th and 47th session of the Human Rights Council drew the attention of the United Nations towards the after the pandemic in India and Indian occupied Kashmir and urged the release of political detainees. In a letter to United Nations Secretary General Pakistan Permanent President of New York, Ambassador Munir Akram urged Secretary General to release the political leaders of Indian occupied Kashmir detained in Delhi's Jahar Jail and other detention centers. Likewise, the civil society and Kashmir Bar Association and human rights groups in Kashmir raised this alarm time and again, but we saw the government of India did not give any heed to this and we lost one of our leaders uh, during this pandemic in, uh, who was detained in Udhampur Jail and because of not being provided the basic health facilities in the jail, he was shifted to court, uh, the Jumu hospital where he died and posthumously he was declared a covered positive. So along with him, we, uh, after the abrogation of article 370, 35A and before and after that, uh, lots of people around some estimates say from seven to 13,000 people from Kashmir, uh, from different sects of society were arrested and detained in different centers under public safety act. Uh, though the government of and the Supreme Court of India also asked the government to uh, one to dispense just the jails and also uh, release the prisoners who have a very weak legal basis for their detention. So today's in today's webinar, we are honored to have with us Lars Rice, who is a former MP of Norway and a friend of Kashmir who constituted the Kashmir group in the Norwegian parliament and always was the member of the Foreign Relations Committee of uh, Norwegian parliament. 
We are honored to have Naeem Ahmed Mahjoor, a senior journalist and author from Kashmir. Uh, she's currently in London. Uh, she is joining us from London. We have been joined by Aga Sayyid Muntazar Mandi, a young and energetic uh, political as well as a uh, student of conflict and uh, international relations. He has uh, been the part of many international conferences and webinars during this period, and he works on the uh, conflict resolutions and studies con uh, conflict in uh, Delhi University. Uh, we have with us Sahar Shah, who is daughter of Shabir Ahmed Shah, the prisoner of conscience, a uh, well-known name uh, throughout the world for his sacrifice for the Kashmir cause. We have been joined by Rihanna Ali, advocate, and she is uh, Secretary General of Tahrir Kashmir uh, London. Uh, Mohammed Asan Nontu, who is the chairman of International Forum for Justice and Human Rights, Jumma and Kashmir, uh, the foot soldier in Kashmir, who is uh, doing all his human rights work in Kashmir. Uh, last but not least, Professor Dr. Shukufta Ashraf, who has been uh, is coordinating uh, this webinar. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I'll think straight away, I will go to Aga Sayyid Mundazir Mahdi for his deliberations, as he's in Srinagar, a political activist uh, from a political background. His father is also a political leader, uh, and he also contributes to politics as well as to the conflict resolution. Uh, Mr. Aga Sayyid Mundazir Mahdi, you have the floor. Unmute Aga Sab yourself. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thank you, Altaf Wani, sir, for having me on this important themed webinar. Before I start, I want to express my sincere solidarity with all Kashmiri political prisoners who have been booked behind the bar as sinceres, including Shabir Ahmad Shah Sahib, Naeem Khan Sahib, Yasin Malik Sahib, and a dear friend, Vahid Bara Sahib. <clears throat> as we all know that uh, this NDA government, which took to power in 2014, has been continuously con converting JNK into open prison physical detention, house arrests, and other confine, confinements too are taking place in length and breadth. Most of the confinements are not tried before the courts and are called uh, preventive detentions. Some leaders of APHC especially were slapped with the draconian laws to uh, only to silent the legitimate voice of Kashmir. This whole process which started in 2014, then in 2017 was further advanced in uh, 1st August 2019 with regard to the abrogation of so-called Article 370. The, uh, the abrogation of Article 370 was followed by the eruption of COVID-19. World Health Organization declared it as a global pandemic. And we have seen since then, whole world, be it a superpower, underdeveloped or developed countries are still struggling to cope up with the virus. The Kashmiri political pris prisoners who are in different jails across the country, be it inside the JNK jails or outside the most infamous Tehar jail, Two are facing a terrible fungibility. And we have seen, as Altaf sir rightly mentioned, how late Sahrai Saab was uh, denied a medical attention and he lost his life uh, around uh, 300 kilometers away from his home. Other uh, Kashmiri political prisoners are deadly fighting these diseases. And it's pertinent to mention here, these leaders, be it Shabir Shah Saab, uh, Naeem Saab, Yasin Saab, they are all uh, having multiple ailments. 
and doctors have uh, mentioned that these ailments be it diabetic be it ca uh, cardiac problem be it kidney problem it these ailments are easy host for deadly coronavirus then we uh, recently in the month of uh, april and march we saw how india uh, became a uh, hot bed of uh, covid second wave and still as of now there is no clarity on the conditions of uh, prisoners with regard to uh, vaccination and other medical assistance now medical authorities have come up with a number of uh, variants they have discovered across the india and delta variant being the most lethal variant of this covid 19 i was just going uh, through uh, some reports where chief justice of india has uh, flagged the rapid proliferation of virus among the prisoners inside the congested jails as a, he has declared is a matter of concern he had said it is required to decongest the jails as it concerns the health and the right to life of prisoners at the end i want to urge in the inter international community to remind the government of the day which is sitting in new delhi to remind its commitment that, uh, which it has signed in the form of international agreements on the rights of prisoners during a disaster to fulfill the commitment and release all the political prisoners in journalists and activists unconditionally thank you Uh, thank you, Agha Sir, for your input. As you know, the right to health of prisoners articulated within the economic, social, and cultural rights recognized by International Court on Economic, Social, and Cultural. Besides, Kashmiri prisoners have the right to uh, raise rights raised under the right to life, Article Six, or the right to human treatment, Article Ten. So. I will straight away go to now to Norway, Oslo, to uh, Lars Rice for his input, and later on we will have a question answer with uh, for the Lars Rice. So Lars Rice, you have the floor. Unmute yourself. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Shagufta Ashraf for initiating this important event and also for inviting me to uh, participate. It's a great honor for me uh, to be part of this panel of experts and uh, I'm, I look forward to learn more about this very um, important topic that has been given to all of us. Um, and of course, the, the pandemic is the main topic now in so many countries. And um, we know that India is, uh, has a, an enormous problem which has grown in the last months, especially, and then we will look at the impact on the political prisoners in Kashmir. So for me, it's indeed a topic of great interest. Um, as the moderator said, I have been engaged in Kashmir, Kashmir for a long time, almost 25 years. I initiated and um, founded the Kashmir group in the Norwegian parliament and visited the area on both sides of the control line several times. 
And uh, it has been my honor also in the years after I left the parliament to continue to work to highlight the, the world's attention, to try to attract the attention of the international community um, on the conflict uh, in Kashmir, which is now almost 75 years old. Uh, I think 2022-2023, we will mark 75 years of a very sad an anniversary. Uh, concerning COVID-19, India has become one of the hardest hit countries in the world. The crisis has grown and it's a matter of time when India will uh, pass United States in the official statistics, having the highest number of deaths in the world. Um, and. Uh, Experts have stated already that official death toll is a complete massacre of data with a true number of deaths, possibly two to five times higher. Uh, if we look at an interview with uh, uh, Wyrans Murad Banaji, a mathematician at London's Middlesex University, he states that the coronavirus uh, related deaths have already crossed 1 million uh, in India. In the United States now it's 600,000. And uh, Lancet is in, in, in his editorial, um, in Lancet, he lambasted Modi's incompetence with the people he rules, saying that instead of devising ways to control the situation, he seems more concerned with removing criticism on Twitter and election campaigns and so on. In the middle of March, the cases started to increase in an alarming way in India. And researchers warned that another wave was coming. At that point, we could observe that uh, India's wealthy overclass, they flew to safer areas such as Dubai, the Maldives and Sri Lanka. But the poor were left to the mercy of the government. And the government was widely convinced due to a false belief that India had now become immune to the coronavirus. In April, while millions of people begged for medical help, and at this point, India had become worse than Brazil. We observed that Modi and his interior minister, Ahmed Shah, were engaged in campaigning in West Bengal of course, without wearing masks and the void of social distancing norms. And uh, in one election rally, uh, Modi hailed the maskless crowd for coming out. In every direction I see, he said, I, uh, I see a large audience. I have witnessed such a rally for the first time, he says at this point. And then he said, the next step is more important. Go and vote and take others too. So rather than intensifying public health messaging and ramping up interventions like banning mass um, gatherings and encouraging use of masks, Modi and his officials did the opposite. They held mass rallies ahead of elections and they also promoted the Kumbh Mela a Hindu pilgrimage that drew millions of worshippers to a single town, an event Ja predicts will end up one of the biggest super spreader events in the history of humanity. So we see how the government completely failed. And uh, since the arrival of the pandemic, the Modi government has prioritized missing but essential services, especially health services. An independent investigation from the news website scroll. revealed that the Indian government was wasting time inviting bids for a $27 million contract to place 162 oxygen generation plants in 150 Indian hospitals. And we can see the result. 
I have made my own thoughts um, on this when it comes to what President Eisenhower long time ago called the industrial military complex, which means that the politics of power is more important than anything else. But we can make a reflection on this, that um, Moody may have so now which could lead to his downfall. So he, he's interested in power, military power, exercising of his power and to win elections may lead to a big loss. We will wait and see. But one important structure here is of course that the spending on health is so low compared to the military spending so we know that india's total healthcare spending is about 3.5 percent of the gdp far lower than in countries ranging from the world's wealthiest like france and the uk and to more economies like Brazil, South Africa. In, in France, it's 11.3, UK 10%, Brazil 9.5, and South Africa spending 8.3% of their GDP on health. And, um, and then we know that only one third of India's healthcare spending comes from the government, with the rest mostly coming out of citizen pockets. And that essentially means that those who can afford to purchase health, care, uh, health can have it. Um, then uh, an important part of this topic is, of course, how is the situation in India with the pandemic now impacting all the prisoners, the political prisoners in the overcrowded Kashmiri prisons? And um, I happen to know several of these prisoners. Um, I had to meet with the all party Hurit uh, conference leaders uh, 20 years ago. I met with Professor Gilani, uh, sorry, Professor Abdul Ghani Bhatt, and um, all his uh, friends in that group which was a meeting I will never forget. And um, a few months ago, I spoke to Mirwais, um, who has been in uh, house arrest since 2019. Uh, very, very serious situation for him and also for several of the other uh, prisoners. They are being kept in prison without um, a court case, without a legal ground, and without uh, a verdict from a court. And uh, Mirwais managed to smuggle in a phone, and uh, I um, could speak to him on several occasions. But we have been um, not able to help him out of the house arrests which he is in. Um, it's, a, it's a very sad situation for the prisoners. They are uh, at a high risk of getting the COVID-19. And uh, what can the world community do? Not very, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, but the COVID-19 has now been discovered in many prisons and uh, it doesn't help that lawyers and activists are calling for the release of the political prisoners. Uh, but we have uh, seen some prison data um, which revealed that 119 inmates in 13 prisons in India administered Kashmir have tested positive for COVID-19. Another 258 out of 4,573 prisoners in these prisons are also suspected of having contracted the virus, but it has not been confirmed. Of course, these figures are already a couple of months old. So we fear that many of the prisoners in the 
uh, Kashmir prisons without getting any help. Sorry? Uh, sorry, did you say something to me? Okay. Uh, I I will it get was, to my it, I will get to my no, it was distortion from other side, not from my side. You may continue. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I, I I will I will get to my my conclusion. But I to to summarize um, the situation for the Modi government is of course serious, which actually be maybe hopeful for us who have been fighting for years and years for the freedom um, for the Kashmiri people. And I think the, the fatal mistake of uh, Prime Minister Modi, how to solve uh, the, or to, how to handle the pandemic, has sown the seeds for his own downfall. And the coming months will, uh, will show that. It is uh, impossible for me uh, to hold a speech uh, concerning Kashmir without giving some recommendations um, on how we can work together to impact the international community, uh, to make steps in order to improve the situation and finally give freedom for the Kashmiri people. And I think point number one should be to ask India now to manage the COVID-19 crisis in Kashmir, which is in, in the whole disputed territory of Kashmir on the Indian side, where they have the access and have possibility and to prioritize this. And since uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations has uh, announced officially that the Kashmir dispute has to be resolved under the United Nations Charter and uh, also under um, resolution from the Security Council. Therefore, the world power should bring pressure on India to reinstate Article 35A and revoke the controversial domicile uh, law went India to change the demography of Kashmir, which is now going on. It's like a classic occupation, which is going on now, where India really wants to change um, the, the demographic of, of the state. We should call upon the member states of the United Nations Human Rights Council to support the inquiry of Commission on Kashmir as recommended by the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights. And I'm sure we can work together on this, um, uh, Shagufta Ashraf, uh, and I would like to contribute on that point. We should formally call on the Indian government uh, to cease its violation of human and political rights of the people of Kashmir. And I think the way to do this could be my point number five, to ask the Secretary General to send a fact-finding mission to both sides of Kashmir to make an official assessment of the situation. We are in desperate need to put Kashmir on the international agenda. And that is often the beginning of finding a solution when we manage to go to the capitals of the world and get this topic high up on the foreign policy agenda in the parliaments and in the corridors of power in the governments. We should persuade the Secretary General Guterres uh, to appoint a special envoy on Kashmir. And of course, for me, it's, it would be natural to propose my own former prime minister, Helmand de Bonnevik, who was a prime minister for many years uh, in Norway from my party, and he has already visited both India and Pakistan after he uh, resigned as a prime minister. He has visited both sides of the control line in Kashmir. And he's probably the only world leader who has met the whole leadership of the all party Hurid conference. Therefore, I think that would be a very strong name to propose to the Secretary General to get a move on this issue. 
we should demand that India grants unhindered permission for all international human rights and humanitarian organizations to carry out investigative and assistance programs. We should call upon India to provide access to all electronic media uh, to Kashmir. Then we should persuade both governments of India and Pakistan to re-invoke peaceful dialogue along with legitimate leadership of the people of Kashmir. And finally, we should insist that India releases all political prisoners due to the worst conditions of the prisons because of COVID-19 pandemic. I look forward to work together with you on these topics and uh, I am available and ready to stand up for the rights of the people in Kashmir. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lars Rice, for your contribution. Your suggestions, your recommendation is a very workable one. And we are looking forward to work with you on these recommendations very sincerely. And we have been uh, asking the government of India uh, to give unhindered access to the UN uh, agencies to investigate the human rights violations in India occupied Kashmir. And we have asked also the government of Pakistan to give the access to, uh, to these uh, UN special reporters. You rightly pointed out that uh, the states and human rights council should appoint a commission of inquiry as recommended by the high commissioner. We should pursue for that. We should work together and lobby for that so that states can decide on it. Your all suggestions are very much uh, workable and we look forward to work with you. And I think uh, there's a lot more to do on this and we will continue to help. You rightly pointed out that uh, how pandemic uh, was upsurged in India after the Modi and Shah at the election rallies and Kumbh Mela, and then they put the restrictions in India, but uh, they had the, uh, some sort of uh, tourists, uh, state managed tourists making the tulip uh, visit of the people and then uh, transferring all these viruses to the Indian occupied Kashmir. Then we saw a, a huge upsurge in the coronavirus in the Indian occupied Kashmir. Before that, there was not that much of upsurge. So they, one way or the other way, they try to uh, do what they can do to harm the people of Kashmir. I will now go to Naeem Ahmad Mahjur Saiba, who is a journalist, author, who is a Kashmir watcher, and he, he has been there uh, to witness all these things for years and has reported to BBC and has written extensively on this uh, issue for years. Excuse me, Wali, sir. Yeah. 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 Um, excuse me. Uh, can we take some questions? Because Mr. Lars has to go uh, for another Naima, meeting. Majur, uh, we will find some questions also. So she will, uh, after her reservation, we will take questions from others too. So Naeem Ahmed Majur, okay. you have the floor. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum to everybody and uh, good afternoon, Mr. Lars. Uh, thank you, Kashmir Institute of International Relations and World Muslim Congress uh, for inviting me to be part of this LEARN panel and uh, allowing me to express my anguish over the situation 12 million people of JNK are facing, especially those hundreds of Kashmiris who are languishing in jails without any access to medical or legal help, even during this uh, horrible pandemic. Uh, recently, I wrote about the incarcerated leadership uh, of Kashmir in one of my columns for Independent. And I will grab this opportunity to share a few excerpts with you. As all my learned friends have spoken and will speak about the plight of people and their leadership in Kashmir, the issue has been made so complex and so enormous 
that it must be everybody's concern and everybody's moral responsibility irrespective of ideology, faith, or leanings, to raise it at every forum, we get chance of an audience. Uh, we must have to formulate a strategy to make the world listen to the human tragedy that is unfolding every moment of this historical conflict. I, as you have already mentioned, Altaf Saab has mentioned it, Hurriyat leader Muhammad Ashraf Zahrai was not the first Kashmiri who died or was killed in captivity, but he is the first freedom leader whose life was consumed by the rising tide of this COVID-19. He had informed his family about his severe illness in jail and no access to proper medical treatment. When he was near death, he was shifted to the hospital where he was declared dead. His death comes within the purview of custodial killing. According to its definition, if somebody dies in custody due to illness or has accidental death, it amounts to custodial killing and demands judicial investigation according to international covenants. His family had to wait for his dead body soon after the funeral. Imagine his members of the family were arrested. His death demanded international condemnation, but I'm sorry to say we feel let down. Kashmiris are suffering suffocation of forced silence and cannot breathe due to the threat of draconian laws like Public Safety Act and UAPA. But it was felt by many that his death, Sahrai Sahab's death in custody, did not get proper mention, condemnation, and condolences even by those who are stakeholders of this Kashmir conflict. We all know that the situation was too grim in India's 1,350 prisons, and still it's worse where health and basic facilities are not available to 4.5 million Indian inmates. Most of the prisons were badly affected by the coronavirus without any notice. The Supreme Court of India had to advise the central government a few times to take immediate steps to reduce the number of inmates in jails. It was not applied to Kashmiri prisoners held in Indian jails. The court's recommendation was not applied to those prisoners also who have been arrested under the Public Safety Act. This category included almost all Kashmiri prisoners who have been held captive under the PSA as a false threat to India's sovereignty and integrity. Despite years of captivity, their trial has not even begun. Only two days back, youth from Ranawari, Bashir Ahmed Baba was acquitted of all charges after being in prison for 12 years. He has lost his youth. He has lost his future. He has lost his innocence. And imagine his mother told one of the journalists in Srinagar that I sold my goal to plead for his innocence for 12 years. According to one of the senior lawyers of the Supreme Court, Indian investigative agencies have been intimidating political prisoners in jails and pressuring them to give up their demand for political aspirations. So far, they have not succeeded. And even lawyers are not allowed to talk to political prisoners because they are facing backlash from Hindutva elements. Earlier, soon after the second wave of COVID-19 was consuming hundreds of lives daily, a few lawyers of Jammu and Kashmir Bar Association had requested for the transfer of Kashmiri prisoners from Indian jails to Kashmiri jails, to which the government objected, arguing that since the zone has been reduced to union territory, citizenship laws have got simultaneously scrapped. Kashmiris can now be held in any prison in India. Only two months ago, 31 prisoners were shifted out of Jammu and Kashmir 
to Haryana, where the jails were worst hit by COVID-19. One of the close associates of Yasir Malik told me that government argument has become like an abyss in which there is no other way but to fall. And this abyss is getting deeper and deeper, especially for Yasin Malik. Yasin Malik's nine-year-old daughter, Razia Sultana, has repeatedly requested to see or talk to her father. But her case is neither heard nor is she allowed to see him. More than two dozen pro-liberation leaders are currently being held in Indian jails. The other Hurriyat leaders have been kept under house arrest and are forced to live in isolation at a time when COVID has left every single person mentally scarred and bruised. Ordinary citizens, mostly young social activists, lawyers, and students have been languishing for many years without any contact with their families. Many families even have no clue where their dear ones have been put in captivity. There were many reports about overcrowded prisons in Kashmir that were declared breeding place for COVID-19 by the local health officials of Kashmir. In one of the prisons in Anantanag, 47 prisoners had contracted the deadly virus that had spread there, and within four days, 97 cases had tested positive. One of the prisons in Kashmir that has a capacity of 80 inmates had more than 200 during the pandemic. And I don't know how many more have been added in recent days. Family members of these detained fear their loved ones will die inside the prison because nobody could find a way to monitor their well being. There is no communication and there is no connection. In 2018, I met more than two dozen youths, including pro freedom leader Masirat Alam at Court Belwal in Jammu. And they all told me about the intimidation, harassment, suppression they had been facing in prison. Just imagine the situation now when COVID has claimed millions of lives despite people living in the comforts of home, having medical facility, following social distancing, getting day-to-day -day information on precautionary measures. How should we visualize the lives of those in the crowded jails without light, without medicine, without social distancing, and without hygiene. It will be a miracle if we still find them alive and that too, not losing their mental balance. In one part of Tihar, at one point, more than 300 inmates had contracted COVID-19. One of the relatives of a prisoner wrote that 250 prisoners in Tihar are suffering from coronavirus coronavirus and two prisoners are dying from the epidemic every day. True that thousands of helpless people in India were begging authorities for beds, oxygen, medicine, and hundreds of dead bodies were being dumped in rivers or ordinary Indians were finding no place in crematoriums for the last rites of their dear ones. There are hundreds of such heartbreaking stories, but that doesn't justify the callous approach towards political prisoners of Kashmir. Indian leadership did not say a word about the helplessness of it as people who voted it to rule them. I don't know how we can make them hear the heartfelt cries of those daughters who keep appearing on social media every day for their father's medical checkup or bail. Sahar Shah might bear me out, she told me that the lawyers advised her that her father's case is political and expecting justice from the court is a waste of time. And then the court has asked Shabir Shah recently to declare his belief in the Indian constitution before his bail. I hope the lawyer have referred the cases of Indian leadership, including Gandhi, when they were fighting against the colonial power for freedom with the same justice system Britain had in place in the subcontinent at the moment. Instead of listening to the cries of the relatives of these political prisoners, the government has repeatedly shut down their 
Twitter accounts and forced them to silence. Sahrai's death has again become a mystery for every single soul in Kashmir. Did he die of the coronavirus or could he not endure the torture at this age? Who will determine this when administration, police, and courts are mostly run by the Hindutva mindset? A 70-year-old man was declared a threat to the integrity of 1.2 billion nation. Have they left any chance for Kashmiris to demand, to demand justice from their courts? The 12 million Kashmiris have been locked up in a big jail for the last two years with suppressive laws of UAPA, PSA, and other laws. Now, our marginalized communities are harassed with eviction notes to leave land, leave house, leave property, or face jails. So what should we do? We have been given an understanding recently about some back channel diplomacy is going on between India and Pakistan that has resulted in ceasefire agreement, or there are news of some cultural exchanges also recently. I don't know whether it is true or we should believe these reports. We all cherish this dream of peaceful resolution through dialogue, including all parties to the conflict. But it needs to be taken into consideration that before embarking on Bonhomme path, at least some confidence building measures must be assured, like the release of all prisoners, halt to cordon and search operations, lifting of restrictions on media, social media users, stop encounters or witch hunting of youth, and especially demilitarization of cities and towns. Any future talks between the two countries must have Kashmiri representation and any formula or solution must be discussed with people before working on it. More importantly, I believe that it's only the Kashmiri diaspora uh, across the globe that must unite to engage with human rights organizations and show them the human aspect of this tragedy. Every single case of incarceration, pellet or bullet victims, molestations, evicted families. It needs a proper documentation so that it can be raised with think tanks, policy makers, media outlets with evidence and proof. Thank you very much for listening to me and giving me a chance to share my ideas. Thanks. Thank you, Naima Majur Saiba, for your wonderful presentation taking us to the business, the conditions of business and your experience meeting the inmates and also the recent happenings in Kashmir. And also, also you very rightly said that all, if there is anything to be done on Kashmir, it should be uh, the Kashmiri genuine voices should be included in that decision-making process. And before that, the confidence building measures, you said the release of political leaders, and demilitarization of towns and cities and putting in fault in the siege and search operations and these extrajudicial executions in length and breadth of uh, Jammu and Kashmir by taking young boys in captivity and then killing them as uh, um, branding them as militants and giving this uh, ongoing freedom struggle a bad name. This has been uh, the feature of the Indian current regime. Uh, I'll now uh, just start with Naima Mahajur Sahib also. If you have any questions and queries, last rise uh, will respond. And then we will go to Sahar Shah. If any Sahar Shah, Agas Sahib, do you listen to me? You can also have some questions. Yes, Naima Ji. Uh, I just want to ask uh, Mr. Last that, uh... Uh, I don't know um, how far it is true that uh, there, there are many think tanks which are involved in this peace dialogue between India and Pakistan and some back channel diplomacy. Uh, but um, I don't know what is the format or the layout and the, what are the points, important points which are being discussed within the stakeholders. And is, is, uh, uh, do you have any sense of it? I mean, is it really going or we are just hearing these reports because um, most of the times these reports are planted with the uh, motive 
And uh, if you can throw some light on this, if, because most of the Kashmiris, they want to listen that there is some thing going on between India and Pakistan, because everybody wants this peacefully resolved. Um, uh, can you throw some light on it, please? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Of course, this is our hope and dream that something is secret uh, may go on behind the closed doors. And uh, if it's secret, uh, I don't know about it and uh, you don't know about it. But uh, what I know is that our former prime minister, Bonovic, he really wanted to be a negotiator, a, a broker in some ways to start something. So that's why he really made efforts to spend time both in Azad Kashmir and Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, he, um, he met with all the key leaders, but there is one very important precondition in order to get something started with, which has substance. And that is that India has to uh, accept or to confirm that they really want some kind of negotiations to go on. If then they don't want, it's very hard to impose it on them. But I think this is the way to go. Actually, everybody listening now should engage themselves um, to go in their cities to their parliaments and try to engage persons like me so we can be active and put the Kashmir um, conflict on the agenda. And I had one young guy in uh, Oslo, Ali Shanavas Khan, uh, who led, uh, who is still the leader of the Kashmir Scandinavian Council, which is my affiliated organization in Oslo. I think if he had not come to the parliament in 1997 to urge me to do something, I'm not sure if it had happened because there is a long line of people who want attention for their problems. But Ali was very uh, insistent. He pushed and pushed so that I would engage myself, that I would travel and so on. So I think that is actually a good idea to be um, very active towards your politicians in your home country, to be really uh, persistent and perseverant and not give up until they are really going. And now, I have been active for the last uh, 15, 16 years after I left the parliament. So it's, uh, it, it has just become a strong personal engagement for me. And uh, if we can work with politicians like that in, in the major cities of the world, I think that is a way to push India to come to some negotiation table, even if it's a back channel, even if it's something secret. Maybe there is something secret going on right now that we don't know about, but uh, that's the, the wish and the hope and the dream. And we know that every change, they start with words spoken, people meeting and developing thoughts and try to impact the situation. But we also know that I think some pressure is needed uh, because people don't want to move from status quo without a pressure. And we have to think about that. What can that pressure be and how can we elaborate on that towards India? Thank you very much, Lars. Thanks. You're most welcome. Vanisa, I have a question too. And yeah, Rihanna, Rihanna has and... first question. Rihanna. Rihanna first. Rihanna raised her okay. hands first. Rihanna. Then second me. Yeah. Rihanna, unmute yourself. I think Rihanna is somewhere absent, perhaps. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, my question is uh, yes. Uh, can you can you hear? Yeah, it's very difficult to hear you. Because your voice is mute. You are, we look, you are right. muted. Yeah. Unmute yourself. Microphone. Diana, unmute yourself. 
as long as Rihanna connects again, Shukufta, you may go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Vani sir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lars, for honoring us today. And you know, uh, you recommended a very, very worthwhile uh, recommendations, similar to the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, recommended in his in his both reports of 20, uh, 2018 and twenty nineteen. But the question is, um, I mean, if uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights is recommending dozens and dozens of recommendations to the government of India. And the attitude of the government of India is that uh, they are not even bothering what the international community, even UN is asking or, you know, uh, putting pressure through the UN and uh, entire uh, member states. If they are not, uh, you know, willing to implement uh, and respect those all recommendations to serve, you know, the humanitarian law and international law and all that. Uh, what do you think that do we have some sort of out of the box idea that if it won't work like it is not working, so uh, then then what can what can we do? What are the possible other options we can exercise? Of course, uh, um, uh, through definitely platforms and you know um, through the help of international community and all. What else we can do? Uh, any any suggestions in this regard? Thank you. I think. Um... Now I think Rehana is unmuted, so we can get to her afterwards. Um, I think uh, we really have to, well, I think point number one would be to, to hope for a political change in India, that it's uh, really going down with the Modi government in their, in their uh, approval ratings now, and that may have serious consequence in the elections. And then we can hope that the new government in India will be more willing to look at what are the advantages for India to change their policies uh, on Kashmir. And we should elaborate on that, how to, in a way, help India to find the reasons why they should engage. So when I say help, that could uh, uh, include some kind of pressure so both some advantages but also be aware of the big disadvantages if they don't uh, allow a dialogue like this uh, to be started so i i don't have a clear answer what it can be but i think uh, an expert group should sit down to find out how to get india engaged in talks about this and uh, we know some things, of course, they want to be a member of the Security Council. And uh, we have to make sure that they can never become a member of the Security Council. I mean, like one of the permanent members, unless they start to uh, respect the Security Council resolutions, which they have not respected since 1947, 48, and on and on and on. So uh, that is something very important uh, that we have to work on. But I think there are other things that we should uh, elaborate on. How to get the right people, the influential people in India to the negotiation table. That would be fantastic. And Rihanna. Thank you, Rihanna. Rihanna. Uh, yes, uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. I'm there. Okay, um, my question was that uh, we actually all know that there are a lot of Kashmiris based in Europe, and we do hear actually uh, from the European Union a lot of like statements uh, for, for Kashmir, and we see a lot of delegations uh, going to Jammu and Kashmir, but the problem is that we only hear these statements, but we don't see any kind of Im impl like implementation, like anything happening uh, more than statements. And the other question I actually do have that I'm very su surprised with that the Europe knows uh, what India is actually doing in Jammu and Kashmir. Still, it voted it to actually become the uh, Council of Human Rights. So this seems something very strange that, that like, um, well, one side they're actually talking about Kashmir, delegations are going there, and then still India is actually getting a place to actually be become a part of the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council. Thank you. Well, I agree with you um, totally. We cannot, uh, of course, every uh, action starts with words, but it cannot stop after the words, then everything stops. So I completely agree with you. 
Uh, and uh, just, I think in London, there are um, several hundred thousand Kashmiris living in London. Why can't they uh, be more organized to uh, put pressure on the British Parliament who has a special responsibility here because Great Britain created the problem, so to speak, because they left uh, India without solving the problem. And we have seen this in so many conflicts that the, the British, they just left different areas. That is uh, Palestine, it's uh, Sri in Sri Lanka, in India and Sudan, many, many other places where Norway has been engaged in uh, diplomacy. Uh, we have seen the British uh, just leaving. So they, from my point of view, have a special responsibility to engage themselves. And they have maybe more influence than others as well. So we should work with the British, make them aware of their historical and moral responsibility to engage themselves. And uh, yes, you are right. There are, there are so many uh, thousands of Kashmiris in the capitals of Europe. My wish is that they could engage themselves to get more politicians uh, like me to engage and to spend time on Kashmir, I think that may help not only to hold speeches like this, but actually to do something in, uh, in the respective parliaments. And I'm, I'm very eager to, to contribute to that, but we have to do it uh, together, uh, Rehana. I do agree with you. Uh, going back to the first part, because I actually li live in the UK as well, and I'm actually the information secretary for Tariki Kashmir, which is one of the uh, largest organization uh, uh, that we actually help the Kashmiris. We are actually uh, like one-to-one -one basis uh, with, with the parliament, and we are trying our best to en engage our government as well. But because of COVID-19 situation at the moment, uh, we actually can't actually do much, but we are trying our best. But then I believe that if the uh, other countries in Europe engage with us, like people like yourself, we can do more because we, we can't just leave it to the British government. Although it, it is a problem, which is actually there because of them. So I think that if all the uh, countries in Europe engage, because there's a lot of Kashmiris in Europe, we can go forward. But yes, I do believe that uh, it has to be more than words. Thank you. Yeah, and we yeah. missed Dr. Tucker out in London. He did an amazing job and uh, to impact the members of parliament, the friendships that he created in the parliament was very um, important. And I think to build friendships with, with the members of parliament, lifelong friendships is uh, very important. And uh, Dr. Tucker died too early. That is sad. So I hope many people can take up, and I understand you are one of them, to take up the legacy after Dr. Tucker in London. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. It was a wonderful question answer session with Lars Reyes. And uh, rightly pointed out, it is responsibility of the diaspora, uh, Kashmiri diaspora living in the capitals of Europe to engage the parliaments, parliamentarians, politicians, and, and diffuse the Indian propaganda, the way the Indians are making the propaganda, the way they are engaging the parliaments, and they are creating uh, confusions among the minds of the policymakers in Europe. So it's the responsibility of the Kashmiri diaspora to unite, uh, not to have their uh, separate voices, and the huge diaspora we have, they have to contribute collectively. Uh, we are very proud that Ali worked hard with the last rise and in a, when Ali was too young. Uh, at that age, he worked with Lars and now it has been now almost three decades now Lars is working on Kashmir and Sittal is uh, ready to work for Kashmir in future also. So I'll straight away go now to Sahar Shah. Sahar, you there? Hello, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sir Shah is daughter of Shabir Ahmed Shah, uh, the prisoner of conscience of uh, already named Ahmed Mahjur Sahiba and Aga Muntazar Mahdi in their uh, deliberations did mention about him. So, sir, you have the floor. 
assalamu alaikum as you have given my introduction i i would like to introduce myself again i am daughter of the prisoner of conscience shabir shah a staunch selfless sincere peace loving personality who has spent more than 33 years in jail now he has led from the front and has always been in harm's way away from the limelight he continues to languish in indian jails in pathetic conditions whenever he was free from the jail he talked about unity amongst kashmiris for carrying forward the mission of freedom whatever little time i have spent with him he has engraved a sense of a fighter in me to stand against the oppression and to stand for the rights of kashmiris which was promised to us each day of his life inspires us to be steadfast sincere and brave in taking any course of action which leads us towards truth and we stand for our rights and the oppressed people of kashmir the unjust onslaught against us in extreme and warlike conditions he has always stood for peaceful methods of resolving the kashmir dispute he has never shied away from talks and from talks with anyone who is willing to talk about kashmir and always portraying the real picture of the plight of kashmiris and the dark future of the subcontinent without Re- resolving the core issue he has talked to all the former prime ministers of india dignitaries diplomats and leaders from around the globe who understand the nuances of kashmir problem and he has never been provided passport so that he could travel and aware the civilized people around the world to listen to our plight and raise a voice in corridors of powers of the world for resolution of the kashmir issue he himself was offered power many times just to derail him from the line of speaking and leading the cause of kashmir which he never accepted and chose a life of immense hardships and jails it is on record that he has spent more than 33 years of prison 33 years of life his life in prisons with hundreds of cases against him without even a single case proven against him day before yesterday the delhi court asked my father shabir shah's lawyer if your client has faith in the indian judicial system and the constitution ironically in the courts across the world the accused are not asked whether they accept the law and the judiciary or not the courts do justice by keeping the law and testimony the courts do not take dictation from the political leaders and rulers and in more than 34 years of cases the prosecutor couldn't prove a single case against my father my only appeal to the civilized people of the world is to recognize a peaceful struggle of a person for the rights of his people which were promised to them and if not recognizing the person itself at least you can recognize the struggle and inshallah it is the people of kashmir for whom and with whom he is struggling each day of his life for a few free and for a free and beautiful future of kashmir inshallah thank you so much thank you sir shah for your intervention uh, so i'll go straight away to rehana ali for her intervention rehana you have the floor being in diaspora representing a huge organization huge responsibilities on you and on your organization uh, to counter the indian narrative in the european parliaments and especially in the british parliament rehana unmute yourself unmute yourself uh first of all i would like to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to actually become a part of of this panel today i would like to say assalamu alaikum to everybody and good afternoon to to the other uh, my colleagues and the people uh, who are actually listening to us today uh, from 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 uk um i would actually like to pay a tribute uh, to, to the kashmiris uh, who are in prison at the moment our leaders especially to us asia in in darabi and yasin malik and shabir shah who have been in prison for a very long time for the freedom of 
of Kashmir. Um, I would like to start talking from the laws. So we have actually three main laws which are operating in Kashmir, actually imposed in Kashmir. And one of the law we have is Unlawful Activities Provision Act 2002. Uh, this law is not only imposed in Kashmir, actually it's in all India. And this use law is normally uh, used against the Muslims and the minorities. Uh, the second law, which is actually the biggest law and the problems in Kashmir are because of that law, is called Asafa law. Uh, of, of Safa law, which was introduced in Kashmir in 1990. And the third law, uh, which I'm going to be talking more about, which is related to our Kashmiri uh, leaders and our Kashmiris, uh, which are behind a prison, even from the age of nine, uh, we actually hear a lot of children have been put in prison under the Public Safety, uh, uh, Public Safety Act uh, 1978. So this law was actually in, introduced in 78 in Kashmir, uh, but this law has been changed. Some of the things have been changed, but the basic thing is that under this law, you have no trial. So basically uh, you are put behind prison for a month and after a month, they are deciding what to do next. And this can go on from three months to six months and, and to nine months and to a year. So in, the, in this time, uh, while, while you're in prison, you're not allowed to have any body representing you like, uh, like a lawyer. You have no in touch with the outside world, especially your, your family. So the, this law can be uh, normally is for two years, but then after, when it's about two years, if they like, they can take you out of prison and put you back in. So many Kashmiri leaders and many Kashmiris are actually behind the bars in, in India and in Jammu and Kashmir because of this law and this has been going on for years so we actually hear the concept of half widows and the concept of half 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 widows comes under this law because the husbands are taken away at places that nobody knows and they have, haven't been in touch with the families for a long long time so those women and their children are suffering from years because they don't understand that if they still have a husband alive or a father alive. Now, this law uh, was actually changed. In, in, in 2018, uh, the, there was a change in the provision which allows uh, the Kashmiri political leaders to be taken out of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, before this, uh, the, this thing was applied, they were not allowed to be taken outside Jammu and Kashmir. But since uh, 2018, they have been taken to different part of India. And the reason is uh, to, to actually take them away so, so they have less contact with the family and less contact with the police leaks so they don't understand what is happening now under under this law uh, like once it's, it's been established, uh, your family members uh, can't see you oftenly. And because of we have coronavirus at the moment, so they're only allowed to see their family once a month. Uh, what we hear is also that till uh, 2018, uh, International Committee of Red Cross officials and Jammu and Kashmir Bar Associate uh, lawyers uh, used to uh, come to the um, uh, jails and prisons to examine this situation, um, how the Kashmiri leaders are being kept and other Kashmiri uh, prisons are being kept. But since 2018, they've been stopped and we understand why it's under the recent regime. Um, after that, we, we actually also see that the Indian, Indian government, um, Yes, so the Indian government likes the political prisoner, prisoners to have less and less uh, contact with the family members. Apart from that, like they are not uh, being given uh, like uh, like uh, like medication on time, and in, even when it comes to like um, having medical care, all the uh, the normal uh, prisoners do get help from the doctors, but the political prisoners on purposely not on are denied medical assistance. So many of our Kashmiri leaders who are actually behind bars at the moment are suffering with a lot of illnesses which are increasing day by day and the reason is that the illness the illnesses they have at the moment are not being treated which is increasing them to actually have more illnesses uh, recently we, we have seen a picture of Yasin Malik uh, which is very shocking to to see that in a few years what his condition has actually become so they have become old before time they are they are weak and they are, and and, and they, uh, they day by day they are not recovering they are actually going going towards dying and and these fears have been put forward by the family members um what the other thing we, we actually see is that in jails no normally if you are a muslim you are given a special dietary we see that india is also denying uh, the the kashmiri prisoners a special dietary like like meat being been given to, to them once a week and another help as well so 
even may, may making a phone call to your family, you're only be, being given like 10, 10 minutes of uh, uh, 10 minutes a week where you can speak to your member family members. But even when you're talking to your family members, you are not allowed to say much to, to them. And the family members are not allowed to see you on a regular basis. So, so this is the biggest problem at the moment. And even if you are a war uh, prisoner, you don't face all these things that, that the Kashmiri people are facing at the moment. So some, some people say uh, that the situation situation in Kashmir at the moment comes under war crimes. Uh, personally, I don't think it's war crimes because in a war crimes, there is a war be between two people who are who are like, like standing in front of each other with modern weapons and with other accessories. But in this war, we don't see the situation. Kashmiri people have no weapons or anything to save themselves. The only thing they have is uh, to, to save themselves that, that they get uh, get de detained or they get booked for is actually stones. Even children of nine years and young and older are actually be being detained for 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 through through uh, like stones. Um, I would like like to say that a lot of the deaths are taking place at the moment, but they are being given the given the name of coronavirus. Like recently, we we, we all know that Ash Muhammad Ashraf Sarai has passed away, and the report was given uh, that he was passed away because of COVID-19, which has been proven is not true. And the condition why he has passed away, because he wasn't given health. Now, if you look into Ashraf Sarai's life, uh, he has uh, been in prison, uh, like detained for a long time. And before that, he was under house arrest. So, so uh, before he, he was detained and, and sent away to prison, he had an eye of operation. And after that, he wasn't allowed any kind of checkups check to actually make sure that things things are well. During a, in, in his stay in the prison in, in, in last year, we hear that he suffered a lot of torture. And because of the torture he suffered, he actually lo lo lost his hearing. So he had a lot of problem uh, with actually hearing and walking. And even when he was trying to make phone calls to his family, like walking up out of his cell to actually make phone calls to his family, that was quite hard for him because he didn't feel that, that he was in that condition to walk. So, so the Kashmiri prisoners are not given any kind of, not only medical health uh, being looked after, they're not, they're not even allowed to be walked uh, to actually go out of their cells and have a little walk, have a little exercise, or being given some other rights of other prisoners. So their condition is really, really bad. So I think that the world community, especially Kashmiris, should actually get together and, and they should pressurize the United Nations and the humanitarian organizations to actually work on this, or otherwise India is going to be using the excuse of COVID-19 to make sure that our Kashmiri leaders are not alive. Now, one thing else I would actually li like to let you know that at the moment, the capacity of prisoners in a prison is 18, but at the moment, what we see is that 25 prisoners have been put in, in a prison, although there is COVID-19 uh, uh, like issue at the moment, India is not taking this into consideration. And we all understand that India is one of the countries at the moment, which is facing a lot of issues when it comes to COVID-19. On a daily basis, we can see thousands and of people who are dying. But despite that, Indian government is not listening and not letting the uh, Kashmiris come back to Jammu and Kashmir. Now, in 2018, as I said earlier, that they actually removed the provision where Kashmiri leaders were, were taken out of Kashmir. And the other reason why they are taking Kashmiris out of Kashmir and putting them away, so the far they go, the less they are going to be heard. Uh, what we hear is that in August 2020, five inmates in Srinagar jail were tested positive. So we can see a lot of uh, prisoners have been tested uh, positive at the moment because of COVID-19 situation, and India is not taking much kind of care in that. I'm not going to go into a lot of details because my colleagues before me have actually said a lot, so I'm not going to be repeating myself. So I'm going to try to say the things which were not said earlier. Um, and, uh, and all of the, these the, the details I'm, I'm actually passing on to you um, have been actually uh, put forward by uh, Asan Atto, uh, who, who is the chairman of the International uh, Forum of Justice uh, for uh, uh, Justice Human Rights, Jammu and Kashmir. So the High Court uh, of India in December 2020 ordered uh, the, 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 the prisons, prisoners to update uh, update the jail manual because they were not following the Jammu and Kashmir manual, they were following the Punjab manual. So they've been asked to up update their own manual and, and to stop following other uh, man manuals uh, from, the, from other Indian states. Um, 
what we see is, see is also that at, that at the moment, uh, that not only offline, even online, like, like people are having a lot of, a lot of issues, like Christian media activists, like myself and other people as well. Now, article can actually represent a free human who has a right to like on social media and, and, and on the internet as well. Um, uh, closing down accounts, suspending accounts, and actually uh, trying to restrict accounts. Recently, we all hear that in uh, that, uh, that, that Indian uh, goons, like especially BBJP and RRS goons, attacked the Twitter office in Delhi. And the reason was that they don't want the, the, uh, the reality to come out in front of, of the world so people can see really what is happening. Myself and other friends of mine who are human rights activists, and I'm also the information secretary for, uh, uh, for the Tariki Kakashimi. Um, so, so, so basically, like my account has been banned in India, and and what I read is that that they have banned my uh, my account under the Information to Technology uh, Act 20, uh, uh, two, 2000, and is um uh, under 69A. Uh, they have actually banned banned my account, and and there's two ways of banning it. First uh, attempt is that they get in touch with you and let you know that your account is actually banned for for the reasons that they think that you are giving out wrong information or. Or, or, or you're saying things against this, this state of India. On the other uh, stages, when it's emergency, uh, they, they don't get to consult you, but they ban the account. So basically my account and many other people I know, our accounts have been banned in India under the second uh, condition, which is emergency banning. So I just don't understand that, like why do, do they have to have emergency banning and what did I say wrong? Because whatever I'm saying today and whatever I say on Twitter, on, on, on Twitter and, and whatever I'm saying in my articles or in my conferences, everything is on social media because the social media is flooded with all the information I'm saying. Despite that, they have banned my account and they banned other people's account. And if I was in India, they could have actually banned me under 66A. And I and I do believe believe that some 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 some, some members who are taking part in the um, uh, conference today, their family members have been banned uh, and taken away under this. Um, provision as as well. So um, I, I would just, just like say uh, like to say at the end is that we all as a community, community uh, humans have uh, been part of uh, Europe and Pakistani and the international uh, uh, like uh, bodies who are watching us at the moment. We should all get together and we need to ask India to stop these human rights violation it is doing. I'm not going to call it uh, war crimes because it is above war crimes. And one thing before I go, the Public uh, Safety Act, which is imposed in Kashmir, why the Kashmiri leaders are suffering, has been named a lawless law by um, by in, in, uh, like international amnesty uh, to, uh, in, in 2010. They said that this law is a law lawless laws. So I would ask the international community to please uh, ban these laws. Please ask the United Nations, human rights organizations, and other governments to, to actually step forward and make sure that these laws are banned in Jammu and Kashmir. And once these laws are banned in Jammu and Kashmir, then we can look forward to actually making sure that Kashmir has a referendum. Thank you. Thank you, Rihanna, for your intervention. Uh, you mentioned about lots of laws which are enacted in you know, Kashmir. We have been debating on these laws since, uh, I think, last uh, three decades on these laws at International Fora. And we have lots of reports by international human rights organizations as well as from the United Nations uh, special rapporteurs on these laws. Uh, but uh, it reminds me of uh, late and last webinar also, I paid tribute to Christoph Hans, the late special rapporteur on extra ex executions who visited Kashmir in 2012. And after, uh, when he presented his report in the council, he said that uh, the Indian laws, like Armed Force Special Power Act, is overriding the right to life. And he made a lots of charges against the government of India. His, his report was a very powerful report. But unfortunately, the government of India's response was that uh, uh, Mr. Special Rapporteur behaved like Special Rapporteur, not like Special Prosecutor. So this has uh, this is arrogance of the government of India at international level. But uh, we have to keep faith and keep on knocking 
at the doors of international conscience and keep on talking about Kashmir. We were supposed to be joined by Ambassador uh, Malik Nadeem Abed, the Secretary General of International Human Rights Commission, but unfortunately, he had some chest pain and has been hospitalized. We pray for his uh, speedy recovery. Uh, Ms. Hefza Almi, journalist Al Jazeera Paris, she was supposed to join us. Uh, at last minute, she has some uh, special uh, uh, assignment in Morocco. She has to leave for Morocco. That's why she could not join us. And uh, Shama Nazir had already uh, asked us that she could not join because of uh, her, some other engagements. And of course, uh, Dr. Mubin Shah, I have, I have liked to have him on this panel, but unfortunately he could not join us. So thank you all for your contributions. If anybody has a last word to say, I will open the floor for you. Neema do you want to say anything, Sahad, Aga Sahab? You are mute. You are mute. Uh, uh, I would thank you all for your contributions and for raising voice for Kashmir. And I don't think there is more to say. Uh, we only have to work. Everybody has to contribute and everybody has to engage with the world community to make them to listen to us and uh, try to find some resolution. I mean, with the inclusion of Kashmir. Thank you. Sahar, Sahar, you wanted to say something. Yes, actually I have a lot to say, but now mm -hmm. I'm not, not tired, but it is very torturing for me to repeat all that, mm -hmm. all those things. And I have been attending many webinars now, mm -hmm. but I didn't see a bit of relief till now. So hope for the best. Hope for the best. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Aga sahab. Thank you, Ani sahab, for enabling me to this uh, webinar and able to speak in solidarity with our family members of APHC. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Let's hope for the best. The message from Sahar Shah. We should continue our efforts in highlighting the Kashmir issue. That's what we can do in our capacities. But we need to collaborate, cooperate with each other in our efforts and so that uh, these efforts can bear some fruit and can make some difference on ground. And we have seen that uh, due to our efforts, due to our, these webinars, the, the people who write, the people who uh, raise the voice at different stages, we could see some sort of uh, awareness in the international human rights, uh, especially in the human rights mechanisms, in the United Nations human rights mechanism on the Kashmir, uh, even on the 47th session when High Commissioner uh, did her uh, report on the situation as she did men mention about the human rights situation in Kashmir. She said that she has elaborated on it in the 46th session, but this time she was doing the other uh, conflicts around the globe, which had the very serious human rights violations. But our efforts will make a difference. We have to continue our efforts. Thank you all for listening patiently, for being with us uh, for so long. Uh, with this, I close this webinar. Thank you. Thank you.